Good morning. We'll go ahead and get started. <clears throat> Glad you're here. If you got your Bibles, uh, turn to Psalm 119, and let's read there briefly, and then I'll pray, and we'll finish up from last week and continue on. Psalm 119. And I will read the first 16 verses, Psalm 119. The blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong but walk in his ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your statutes, or when I learn your righteous rules. I will keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth, and in the way of your testimonies I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes, and I will not forget your word. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time together this morning. Thank you that we get to be here uh, with our brothers and sisters in Christ, and to uh, worship, to learn, to grow, to seek to be equipped for every good work that we might walk as disciples of you every day, filled by your Spirit. And I pray for this morning as we talk about the characteristics of your Word, what we believe about the Bible that you've given us based on its own testimony and who you are. Uh, help us to... Uh, be faithful in talking through those things and that they might be applied to our life, that we would grow in love for your commandments, in love for your statutes, in love for your word, as we read about here in Psalm 19. So be with us this morning and uh, glorify your name in our time. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you. Uh, glad you're here again. Uh, we're going to finish up just the last section from last week talking about evaluating English translations. That's where we left off. So I'm going to finish up there and then we're going to begin talking about characteristics of the Bible, what we believe, you could say, uh, theologically, or, or the principles by which we approach God's Word. But before we do that, I do want to open it up. Any questions from last week, or anything that we've covered so far that you want to spend time on here at the beginning? No? Okay, then I'll ask you a more specific question. So, drawing from last week, uh, how has what we've covered so far in the class strengthened your trust? I hope it's strengthened, or maybe not strengthened, but strengthened your trust in the Bible as we have it today. The fact that it existed pretty much in oral translation. Hmm. Uh, to me, that that's, it speaks a lot. Mm -hmm. that, that it was consistent. Sure. So just the reality of oral transmission for a season and uh, the faithfulness with which the, uh, the the scripture was kept. Good. Anything else? faithful legacy of reverence towards God's revelation that we see in Scripture and also historically that we can look to. Yeah. Hey. Oh, sure, yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so historical testimony that supports what we say we already believe about Scripture, right? That it's, the Holy Spirit testifies to its own character and own nature. Yeah, Keith, did you have something? Sure. Yeah, and we don't. We just we don't have the originals, and yet we're able to say. I mean, this is a clear field of study, uh, especially in the last half century or so, that testifies to. And they do. They're doing the same kind of work with other texts, and and the Bible's pedigree is is remarkable, and that's that, that's encouraging, right? We don't base everything on that. We base on what God has revealed and said. But absolutely, that's encouraging. Anything else, Seth? Yeah. Sure. That's helpful on multiple levels, right? You see the testimony of the reverence with which the text was treated and consistency, and yet also the way in which we're meant to approach the text is Jesus' authoritative interpretation of it, which is represented by the Bible as a whole. We look to the Scripture itself. Yeah, yeah. I love that passage. That uh, Yeah. Mark is, is good. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, that's encouraging to me. I hope last week was encouraging to you. And it's um, uh, so a means to look historically, look at different evidence, to be a means to strengthen our faith. And uh, and I hope that's that's what took place for you. So let's finish up from last week. We were, we were talking about translations, brief, brief, brief history of, of translations, kind of major high points throughout translation history. Uh, we talked about the, the the drive for common everyday people to have the text of Scripture in their what we call heart language, their their common tongue, uh, and especially this being a a focus of the Reformation. This this need and desire for common everyday people to have the Bible for themselves, and so that leading to. English translations that we have today. We looked at a few of those high points last week. So just briefly, how do we evaluate English translations? There's a multitude of translations uh, for you to choose from. You go to, to Amazon and you want to purchase a new Bible, or you go to the bookstore uh, and you want to you purchase a new Bible. How do you think about the different translations that we have today? Just want to give you a few key points to, to recognize as you're evaluating translations that we have. First, we would say, uh, in evaluating English translations, we need to acknowledge that theology affects translation. And this, you know, if you've studied other languages, any, any other language, there's this reality that the work of translation is not going to the text and saying, okay, here's this word in the Greek, here's this word in the Hebrew, here's this word in the Aramaic, and let's find the word in English that means exactly the same thing as that word, and it's going to be a one-for-one -one correlation all the time. That's just not how languages work, and that's not to discount the trustworthiness of translations. That's just that's just a reality, and God so intended to reveal uh, to um, to give the text that we look to as Scripture 
in a particular place at a particular time. And so they were in certain, you know, they were in the Greek, the Hebrew, the Aramaic. So the work of translation is not a one for one. If you've looked at any languages, you know that. And so there, we just have to recognize all of us have presuppositions that we bring to the text and varying translations reveal those in different ways. Um, that's just that's a principle to keep in mind. One clear example of this that we can point to uh, commonly, and when you're looking and thinking about theological presuppositions to translation, uh, would be uh, an example would be a Jehovah's Witness and the way in which they translate, for example, John chapter one, which affects. They're bringing the, theological presuppositions to that text and also expecting to receive certain things from that text. So what do I mean by that? When you go to John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word, how does your ESV translate it? And the Word was God, okay? A uh, Jehovah's Witness, their translation, I'm having trouble remembering uh, the common Jehovah's Witness translation, but come to that text, that passage, and you can read it, and theirs will, would read, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God, a little g God. Where's that coming from? You go to the Greek, and they would say, you go to the Greek, and there's not what we would call a, a definite article in front of that word God, theos. And they say, okay, so this is, Jesus is the instance of a God, not the God, not associating him with the God. We would come back to that and say, well, that's just not really how Greek works. Uh, you can, there's, a, there's a Greek grammatical rule in which you can have not a definite article there, and it's still as a proper, uh, pointing as a proper noun that we can still say absolutely. And as if that's the only place in all of the scripture that we're pointing to for the deity of Christ, right? That's not the only one. It's a clear one. So that's just an example for you, a difference there that is very, very clear and, and common for us to understand. There's a variety of those, but we need to remember that theology does affect translation, and that's, that's not a bad thing, right? That's just a reality. That's just, that just is what's taking place. Another uh, reality of translations, and we're evaluating them, we need to recognize that changes in language affect translation. This is just another principle of looking at other languages. Uh, we often think that language uh, remains the same over time. And yet we know that that's just not the reality. We know that how we use words, how we communicate, how we talk uh, changes over time. And it's the same thing when looking at the biblical languages and translations that are being made. That's, that's, uh, that's a judgment call that has to be made when translating the biblical text into a different or a new language or merely updating uh, an existing translation. For example, our English translations. Uh, it's not a one-for-one correspondence. And so it's necessary for us, uh, specifically talking about English translations, it's necessary and helpful for us to revisit over time our, our English translation. Is the, the language that's currently in our translations faithfully and accurately representing the, the, uh, the original idea in the biblical language, in the Greek, the Hebrew, or the Aramaic? An example of this that's common that we can point to, and just to recognize this over time, for example, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Uh, I'll read it. Uh, that's 1 Peter. That would be wrong. Let's go to 1 John. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. This is what John says. It says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Verse 16, for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. In any of your all's translations, if you have something other than this version of the ESV, is there a different word in verse 16 for desire? Does it say something else in your translation? Cravings and lusts. Lust. Okay, so common translation of this verse for many, many years in English was to say, for all that is in the world, the lusts of the flesh and the lusts of the eyes and the pride of life. In our modern use of the word lust, that has an explicitly sexual connotation, right? That's just how we use the word lust. In older usage of that word in English, it had a broader meaning of just general desire in a sense. Uh, in this 
context, right? It's, it is leaning towards sinful desire, but it was more broad. And so modern usage recognized, hey, lust is not a great word to use here because it brings with it this baggage in our, con- our current usage. So let's be a more faithful translation to, uh, to desire. That's just an example. Language changes over time, and so we need to revisit our, our translations over time. And then lastly, translations reflect the different values of translators. And again, this is not a bad thing. This is just the reality of, of how things work. Um, you can look to see this. You can look at the, the opening pages of your copy of Scripture. For example, if you have an ESV... If you have an ESV, probably right after the table of contents, uh, there would be something called a maybe a preface or another page. Mine's kind of a condensed version of the ESV. Does anyone have anything right after the table of contents that says like values of the translators or commitments of the translation committee, something like that, in your copy? Legacy, philosophy, style. Okay, sure, yeah. That's good. Is that an ESV? Yeah. Okay. Anybody have a different translation other than ESV? Okay. What is? Do you have anything in like at the very beginning? Okay. Sure. Okay. Great. Yeah. So that's this is you'll find, often find in your in your copy, the translation committee. So the individuals that. Uh, collectively produced this your translation, which this is how translations are made. Uh, organizations will gather a large group of scholars and uh, uh, scholars of the text to come together and produce a translation. Um, and they will often, in the beginning of the translation, put some sort of a document that says, hey, these are our values, these are our commitments, and these are why we translate the things the way that we do. That's really, really helpful for us to see um, because we there are a variety of uh, approaches, a variety of commitments that translators have when they come to the text that, that influences how certain things are are translated. And just, just for example, uh, there's a, a couple different uh, commitments we could say that influence the different translations that we have and this this chart kind of represents that uh, charting the diff- common different translations where they fit associated with other translations based on the based on the commitments of the translators and when I say commitments I mean the way in which they're approaching what kind of philosophy they're bringing to the text in terms of translating words uh, trying to be strictly more uh, what you could say equivalent, so one word in the Greek or the Hebrew trying to translate to one word in the English, or more uh, what you could call uh, dynamic, saying that they are approaching more of a thought-for-thought thought approach uh, in, in how they, they translate. And you can kind of see where things land here, so formal equivalence. Uh, anything that has a standard in the translation is going to be more so on this formal end. So this would be your word for word. So the most popular ones here would be English Standard Version, uh, New American Standard, and have a lot of similarities to uh, drawing from uh, the King James, King James Version there as well. So on this end, functional, that would be more of what you could call a dynamic equivalence where they're approaching the text in a more thought-for-thought thought translation. Uh, not seeking to be as strictly one for one, and and this is not a this is not a good or bad, bad or good. Just recognizing they're saying on this end of the spectrum, hey, we can't go one for one always. Uh, sometimes there are words in the Greek that don't necessarily need to be represented in the English because we are in an English way communicating the thought that is present in the text. So that's helpful for you to see. Just kind of recognize the commitments there. Um, And you can see a few popular ones, so like your the NIV, Holman Christian Standard, the CSB, those are more kind of in the middle ground between the two, uh, trying to be, uh, trying to be uh, faithful in their own philosophy there. So different approaches to the text. You have dynamic equivalence, more thought for thought, formal equivalence, which would be more uh, word for word translations. Any questions there? Yes, ma'am. (laughs) 
Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Sure. 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 Absolutely. And that's helpful. Yeah. And so, and awkward in multiple ways. It's like we don't really use that word anymore. So it's just kind of awkward. And also, from a language structure sense, <laughs> harder to read. If you has anybody used a New American Standard at any point, or still does? I did it one time. You can just recognize when you're reading the New American Standard, it's a little uh, choppier. Yeah, it's a little clunky. That's a good, it just doesn't quite, like, it, it's, you know, it's easy to understand in many ways, but it just doesn't quite flow when you're reading it. it and that, that's just, that's reflecting, trying to be more specifically word to word, not leave out any Greek words or Hebrew. And when I say leave out, uh, they're not intentional. These people over here are not intentionally just pitching words out the window. It's just trying to represent the same idea. Down on this end, it flows a little bit better, typically, uh, when you're reading, uh, just because trying to be more thought for thought. Uh, and also, a recognition here, on this end, especially your NASB and your ESV, recognizing that there is a big relationship or uh, a, a similar philosophy with the King James Version. And so often there will be phrases that are left in some of the, these translations, maybe not because it's the most helpful in modern parlance or in modern English, but because it's so familiar that if people recognize that this way of phrasing was taken out, they'd be like, oh, these guys are messing with my Bible. Like they're, they're trying to, so you'll recognize there are still some things, especially in the ESV, that seem old and kind of antiquated. Uh, maybe, especially in, you could say, the most popular passages. So like the, uh, the Lord's Prayer, some different places. There, is, there may be more modern helpful ways of phrasing some things and yet they leave the older English just because people would definitely notice if they updated and think that something nefarious is up, which it would not be. It just it's just good to recognize that, that that's there. Mm-hmm. Sure, very similar. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so you, you recognize there's that relationship there with those those texts. Just briefly, a few other things I'll mention, uh, and then I do want to move on to our next part. Um, different translations bring different commitments on even specific words and renderings. So, uh, for example, in modern translations in like the ESV and some others, uh, you will see, usually you'll see a note, especially in the New Testament and in Paul's epistles. Paul will say he is a, he's a servant of God, a servant of Christ Jesus. When that word is used, you usually see a little asterisk and a note at the bottom. And it'll say, this word in the Greek is doulos, which would have been, refer, would have been rendered as slave, right? And then just recognizing in modern, in our current society, slaves bring with it especially in Western society, a lot of associated ideas that Paul would not have been trying to communicate. And so they're just saying, hey, we're going to render this as servant uh, and not slave, and here's the reasons why. A lot of controversy in recent years related to the NIV in particular and others, um, and there's, there's conversations around uh, how to properly translate what we would call uh, gendered language. So, And this is not, don't hear this as... You know they're they're going they're going left on us or anything like that. Don't don't I'm not I'm not saying that at all. But just recognizing in the original Greek, uh, in places today where we would say address men and women, uh, in the original Greek they they would often just use the word man uh, speaking to the men and not in instances where it's clearly gender specific. For instance, in uh, First Timothy. First Timothy chapter 2 from last week, Sunday morning, clearly gender specific, but some instances of broad address where they would say just man in the Greek, which meant all people. We don't speak that way as much anymore, and so there will usually be a reference, a note in your translations that say the original Greek just said man. Uh, we have translated as men and women because 
it seems to be that all people are in mind here. Just When you notice those things, just recognize, hey, this is what they're doing. This is why they're doing it, seeking to be faithful to, to modern English. And people have, you know, objections on some of those things for varying reasons, but it's good to know that they are there. So conclusion, I think, from last week and just what we've been covering the last couple of weeks is that we have faithful translations that we can be confident in, and, and yet we are invited to still have a, a, a critical approach, not in that we're seeking to be critical of Scripture, but we're just recognizing what's taking place in translations and just be aware of those things uh, when we, when we uh, seek to, to come to the Word. Any questions from translation, English translation? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so when you get into like the realm of the message and associated, so we wouldn't even really call those translations. That would be like, uh, what's the right word? It's a, a rephrasing of a sense. Uh, yeah, so it's not even really, not even in the same ballpark as translation. They are... Sometimes you still see like the Living Bible or the reference there. Mm-hmm. Acknowledge that the guy had a pretty... He gave a decent try mm-hmm. at, at scripture for yeah. some man, basically, translating the Living Bible. Sure. But, so not to say that it should be completely discounted. No, not at all. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah, we're not not discounting wholesale anything there. It's you know we just want to recognize um, what's communicating the original idea most faithfully, and if you're in the realm of serious study, really wanting to be as close to the original text as possible, you want to be not you want to be in a translation and not one of these. But also just prince just in principle, if you're talking about anyone or for you yourself, whatever Bible you have access to devour it okay you know that we're not saying here this you need one translation not at all whatever you have access to devour it and and be in it uh that's that that wants that's our commitment from the beginning i, I would think this this approach to go to esv because in some ways it's not your all language you can't take it to the next thing then you mm-hmm. have the choice to go with three <laughs> <laughs> that's great so good <laughs> Sure. Yeah. We just need to recognize the commitments. And, and yeah, but also, too, comparing translations like that can be really, really helpful just to recognize, say, hey, I, I didn't really pick up on that nuance here and, and to reconsider some things. So, yeah, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. Oh, sure. The commitment's there. Yeah. But there are a few things, not every page, mm-hmm. but you can see the contributors or the experts that they use for their study Bible. Sure. It might not be the same as the ESV. Yeah. And so then that affects a little bit on your translation. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah, that's there. Yeah. No, that's good. That's good. Okay, well, we need to get into this week, uh, this week's class. Uh, let's do that. Uh, so week four, characteristics of the Bible. This is, what do we believe? You know, what theological statements are we making about the Scripture that uh, affects how we approach it? Uh, according to who God is, that's, that's principle. We're asking according to who God is. Who is this God that is spoken to us through His Word? And therefore, what do we need to believe based off who He is and what He has said in His Word about the Bible? What are its characteristics? How does it function uh, by the po- Holy Spirit's power? And how should we treat it? How should we approach it? So first, characteristics, characteristic of the Bible would be authority. That we believe that the Bible is 
authoritative for us, for our lives, that it bears a particular God-derived uh, authority over us and, and over the way that we live. So how is this the case and, and why is this the case? Well, first, we would say that all the words of Scripture are God's words. So this must be our, our foundational approach when we come to the Bible, recognizing that God, through his word, has spoken and speaks through his word. Uh, and so that needs to be our most uh, central claim. And so we need to guard against what we could call a, a, uh, a man-centered approach to the Bible. And this is not to negate God's use of men uh, to pen the words of Scripture. That is a clear fact that we cannot get away from, and that's important for us to reiterate, which we're going to look at more. Uh, but we, we need to have a commitment of saying, first, we're going to have a, a God-centered approach to the Scripture, recognizing that it is He who is speaking to us, and that should affect how we read it and respond to it and seek to obey it. So we would say that the Old Testament claims that the Old Testament is the Word of God. So we go into the text of Scripture that Scripture itself is making this claim for itself, that all the words of Scripture are God's words. Specifically in the Old Testament first, uh, we see this in the way in which that God chooses to reveal Himself uh, as recorded in the Old Testament, and that's primarily through uh, who we call the prophets. Uh, God ordained and called messengers to relay God's word to the people, to speak to them in various times and in various ways throughout the history of, of the people of Israel, specifically in the Old Testament. So first, that God speaks by the prophets. Uh, that, uh, for example, uh, Moses, look to Moses, he was given the responsibility to relate God's word to the people of Israel, both both written and spoken. Uh, God himself led the way in writing down his own words for us as we look to the, the two tablets of the Mosaic Covenant, the, the Ten Commandments. God himself wrote them on tablets of stone for the people, and they were communicated through the prophet Moses. He's the one that went up on Mount Sinai and was to relay God's word to the people. Just a biblical text to look at here, and I'll give you some other references for your own, your own benefit. Numbers chapter 22, verse 38. Uh, now this is uh, through uh, Balaam, who was, uh, who was hired to speak against the people of Israel, and yet he still speaks words that are consistent with God's, uh, God's leading. And this is what Balaam says. He said, Balaam said to Balak, behold, I have come to you have, have I now any power of my own to speak anything? The word that God puts in my mouth, that must I speak. And I think that's representative, we could say, of how God spoke through the prophets, that he, he gave them his word for them to relay to the people, and so they were able to say throughout the Old Testament, thus says the Lord, when they were communicating God's word to the people. So God speaks by the prophets. A few other passages for you to look at. Uh, Deuteronomy 18, and this captures in, uh, in different ways throughout the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 18, 18 through 20, and then also Jeremiah 1, verse 9. God speaks by the prophets. Also, God speaks through the prophets, that, that God often chooses to speak uh, by his, and by and through his chosen representatives. So for an, an example of this would be 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 18. This is a prophecy uh, that was given through, through God's prophet to uh, the king, to Jeroboam. And it says, 1 Kings 14, verse 18, Then Jeroboam's wife arose and departed and came to Tirzah. And as she came to the threshold of the house, the child died. And it says, And all Israel buried him and mourned for him according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by his servant Ahijah, the prophet. So God is speaking not only in delivering his word uh, to, the, to the prophets, for example, Moses to bring the Ten Commandments to the people, but also through the prophets, that they prophets were called to speak themselves 
and their words were to be heeded as the speech of God to the extent that it was faithful to God's revelation. We see examples of that also all throughout the Old Testament where God says, hey, evaluate the words of the prophets and this is how you will know that they are my words. There are, there are different examples of that. So another passage for you to look at there would be Jeremiah 37 uh, verse 2. I would encourage you to, to look at that. So God spoke by and through uh, the prophets. And as we've seen in previous weeks, there was this commitment to record and to retain the prophets' words as the words of God. And that is how we have the Old Testament that we, that we have. Old Testament claims this for itself. And also, the New Testament claims that the Old Testament is the Word of God. So we go to the New Testament and we ask the question, which we've done previously, but how does Jesus approach the Old Testament? Which Seth talked about earlier, how does Jesus and how do the Jews themselves, as spoken about in the first century in the New Testament, how are they looking at the Old, Test Old Testament and how are they uh, regarding it? So examples of this would be uh, you know, the classic text about the inspiration of Scripture, 2 Timothy 3.16, recognizing that in that context in which Paul is writing in 2 Timothy chapter 3, he is most immediately referencing what we would call the Old Testament, just recognizing he's, he's writing uh, before the Gospels have been written. He's writing before the, the complete compilation of the New Testament canon, 2 Timothy 3.16, which we'll come back to. But Paul says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So, when we see in the New Testament and also in the Old, but especially in the New, when we see this word used, Scripture, of course, we apply it to our whole Bibles, which is right and good, and we're going to see why shortly. But uh, in the New Testament, when we see that, what are they referencing? They're referencing what we would call the Old Testament, the Scriptures, the writings uh, that God had given. Another example of this would be, uh, which we'll look at in just a second, Second Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 19 through 20, where we see Peter associating the writings of Paul with, he says, the other scriptures. And so Peter himself is equating what he knew Paul was writing to the churches. He says, uh, we'll look at it later, but he says, some of Paul's writings are kind of hard to understand, which I think is hilarious, but it's true. He's like, yeah, Paul's writing some stuff. It's kind of hard to understand as is things contained in the other scriptures. So we see this equation here with New Testament writing with the scriptures. Um, and so that's a, that's a claim in and of itself. We, we saw in previous weeks that Jesus recognized this. We saw this in his own teaching, that he recognizes the Old Testament as the word of God. Uh, many different references for this that you can look to. So Matthew uh, 4, 4. Matthew 19, verse 5, where Jesus is quoting and referencing from the Old Testament, and also Mark chapter 7, verses 9 through 13. That's not exhaustive, but that gives you an example that Jesus himself read and quoted and taught from the Old Testament as the very words of God, as the scriptures, uh, as authoritative. And then lastly, we would claim that the New Testament itself also claims that it is Scripture. So again, um, we referenced Second Peter there. I want to look at Second uh, Peter. I'm sorry, I, I misquoted Second Peter. This passage in Second Peter. Let me read that to you. I got him confused with this next one. But Second Peter one says, "And we have the prophetic word." more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention, as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So speaking to the nature of the prophetic word. And also, we would apply that same principle, as we're going to see, to the way in which the New Testament itself was produced. As the word of God, God working through men, 
speaking through men, carrying them along by the Holy Spirit. That gives us a beautiful insight into our, our understanding of inspiration. How is it that the New Testament itself is the Word of God given to us? What I was referencing earlier uh, is actually 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16. So let's look there. We can see this New Testament New Testament claim about the New Testament being Scripture. 2 Peter 3, verse, I'll begin in verse 15. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. So, again, first century just this acknowledgement that the apostles were writing and circulating their writings among the, the churches. He says, There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. So this clearly Peter is using scriptures as a, as a somewhat technical term. It was used to say, when they say scriptures, he's referring to the Old Testament that they re revered as authoritative. And we see here that Peter is associating, equating in a sense, the writings of Paul with the other scriptures. So a New Testament claim to the New Testament's veracity. Uh, a couple of references for you to go to later. I just want to give you plenty of biblical data. I know we can't spend time in all of it, but 1 Timothy 5 verse 18 on this point, and then also 1 Corinthians 14, 37. I encourage you to look there later. So, we approach the Word of God as authoritative uh, because of who God is and because we believe that the Bible itself is making this claim, that it is to be approached as the authoritative words of God uh, given to us. Any questions there? No? Okay. So under this, uh, under this heading of authoritative, there are lots of implications uh, that we say, say theologically. If the Bible is the Word of God, then that dictates in many ways how we are to approach it and what we are to believe about it. These things being further alluded to and taught, we believe, from within the Scripture uh, itself. So when we say that the Bible is authoritative... You also will hear the language of inspiration, saying that we believe the Bible is inspired. It is the inspired uh, Word of God. And there, there are a variety of ways uh, that people approach and try to ex explain this notion of inspiration. Uh, and hence, you will hear qualifiers added on to it to say, when we say the Bible is inspired, this is the kind of inspiration that we mean. When we say it's inspired of God, uh, that we mean a, a certain thing. So we're going to get to those, uh, particularly what we're arguing for and emphasizing is what's called a verbal plenary view of inspiration. We'll, un uh, we'll unpack those qualifiers here in just a second. But we need to ask the question, where does this language and this notion of inspiration come from? Uh, where are we getting that in Scripture? So again, that's back to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, which we read, where we're actually pulling the, the language of inspiration. Now, the notion is all throughout the Scripture, but the language of inspiration is there in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16, where, again, as we'll read, Paul says, all Scripture is what? Breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching. So this is a, just a beautiful picture where we see that it is, Paul is claiming that the, the Scripture itself, the words of God, are they're as if they're God's breath. That they are spoken by God. They are, they are breathed out by God. So this, this word uh, that's being translated to give us God breathed is, is literally just that. And it's not, it's not found anywhere else in the Bible. It's a unique word. And it's also, we don't see evidence for it 
really anywhere else in the Greek at this time in the first century. Uh, Paul has this thing where he likes to, to make up words sometimes, which is, which is great because he's saying this is a theological truth that I need to communicate, and we just don't have a word to capture it. And so sometimes he makes up words and, uh, that, are, that are really, really helpful. So that's what this God-breathed is. It's, it's literally uh, the, the word for God, so theos, and then the word for breath, for to blow. So theopneustos is the word. So he's saying that the word of God is breathed out by him. And this is, this is not a unique concept. It's a unique word, but this is the case all throughout the scripture. This is a consistent theme. Uh, everywhere from the very beginning, uh, you go to Genesis chapter 1, and God is bringing all things into existence. And how does he do that? He does it by his by his word, he speaks, and all things come into existence. And then also we come to uh, the New Testament, and how is Jesus described? He is described as the the Word of God, in that he he comes forth from God, uh, according to God's triune nature, and he he brings the Word of God. He is he is rightly revealing and communicating and representing and showing who God is, and Jesus being uh, the Word of God. So Paul is saying that the Word, the Scripture is inspired. It, it is the speech of God. And when we say verbal plenary in, uh, inspiration, what are we affirming? Well, we're affirming that it is the words of Scripture that are inspired, verbal. Uh, it's, not just the, it's not just the general message that they represent, or the general claims that they make. No, we're saying that the text of Scripture, the words in the Scripture are themselves inspired, and plenary meaning all. So all the words of Scripture are themselves in, inspired of God. So this is a differentiation from other approaches to inspiration and to revelation, which would say that the Bible is maybe a, a mere testimony to the way in which that God has revealed himself in the past. Uh, so more of a, you could say, like a, a neo-Orthodox, um, if you're in my Wednesday night class, Bonhoeffer, Karl Barth, this would be more of their approach to Scripture, that Scripture is merely a testimony to God's revelatory acts in the past, chiefly in the Incarnation. Uh, but we're going to differentiate from that and say, no, that we believe that it is the text of Scripture itself which is revelation from God. Uh, so it's not merely testifying to something else. It is the Scripture itself is the referent. So we're saying every word is from God, uh, and that's the verbal plenary aspect of inspiration. And then we also would say, referencing that Second Peter passage, uh, this notion of God carrying along people who... who uh, delivered prophecy and revelation, that God works with and through human authors. So uh, differentiated earlier that we don't want to have a chiefly man-centered view of Scripture. You see this worked out in faithful people uh, often, sometimes, that will always approach the Scripture from a more man-centered view, but especially in those that uh, reject the Scripture and um, are seeking to attack its veracity and, and relevance, only having this man-centered view of the Bible. And we say, well, if it's from God, then we can't have only a man-centered view. And yet, we recognize that God did work with and through human authors who they themselves had different uh, styles, different personalities, different education level, different language. So this is just acknowledging that God worked through a variety of men over uh, centuries, over millennia, uh, with a variety of backgrounds in a variety of contexts, a variety of uh, intellectual capacities, you can even say, to pen the text of Scripture. And so through those men, we would affirm that God providentially oversees the composition of the Scriptures. Again, Second Peter chapter 1, this is this notion of the biblical authors being carried along by the Holy Spirit in their writing uh, and in and, and what they were communicating. That's inspiration. We have more of it to unpack in other areas, but any questions there?
from inspiration specifically? Okay. So the scripture breathed out by God, it is God's words. We would also affirm under it's under this heading of authority, uh, we would say that the scriptures are inerrant, that they are true. We would say that if this is an entailment of inspiration, that if every word of scripture is from God, then an entailment of that, a implication of that reality is that every word therefore must be true. This is what we mean. This is what the word inerrancy means. And this is one of those words that can be really, really helpful, uh, but it can also be really unhelpful, I think, in the, in, the, in the fact that we throw inerrancy around, associating it with the scriptures, and yet often aren't really clear on what we're affirming when we say that the Bible is inerrant. So, so what, what does inerrancy claim about the scriptures? Well, it claims that God's word is true, and another way of articulating that is that the Bible itself is true in all that it affirms. So everything that is affirmed in the scriptures, we would say that that affirmation is accurate. It, it, it does reflect reality. It's a true affirmation. Inerrancy um, has been and, and is uh, wrongly understood and wrongly applied uh, in lots of ways in that it can be used to bring an approach to scripture and demand things of the biblical text that the Bible may not be itself be, uh, be claiming. What do I mean by that? I mean that we can have this affirmation. We say, I believe that the Bible is inerrant, and I believe that the Bible is true. And then we bring that approach to the Bible and say, this is what I think true means, and I demand the Scripture to be making certain claims. And yet we have to ask the question, no, how is it that the Bible is, is true in everything that it affirms, meaning that we have to go back to what were the original intentions, what were the claims that were being made by the original authors under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And then that's when we come to the text and say, yes, I believe the Bible is inerrant. And so whatever this text is claiming, I affirm that. I don't get to dictate what the text is claiming. I have to come to it and recognize what's being affirmed, what's being claimed, and then ascribe uh, to that. And so I think uh, in a, we have to recognize that inerrancy itself is a, is a disposition of faith. Meaning, I come to the text, I believe that it's inspired, I believe that it's true, because God is true, and therefore I say, whatever, whatever it says, I'm affirming with that. I don't get to say ahead of time what it says or what I believe it's saying, but whatever it is claiming, that is what I, that is what I affirm. And this all comes from who God is himself, right? That, that God cannot lie. That when God speaks, he speaks the truth always. Uh, that his words are true. I'm not sure if I put references in there. Did I put references in your notes with these? Okay, so those are there. That God cannot lie. God's word is truth. And that God's word is truth without any, uh, as the Baptist faith, the message says so helpfully, without any mixture of, of error. Uh, that God's word is true uh, because he is true. And, you know, another entailment of this that we didn't, we're not going to address directly, but the other word that you hear us associating with Scripture is this notion that it is uh, infallible. This is what we often say, that the Bible is inerrant and it is infallible. Uh, we often put those two words together and we know that they're claiming good things, but we're not really sure what they're saying about the Bible, but we know that they're good. And infallible is simply saying that it's uh, because it's an entailment of inspiration. Again, it's an entailment of the authority of God that that we were saying, if we say infallible, we're saying that the scriptures are trustworthy, that we can trust them, that they will not lead us astray, that we can, according to what they are and what they're claiming, that we can, we can trust them. So again, just a reminder, this is building upon the foundation of our doctrine of God. That's where scripture always has to start, is who God is and how is he, how is he speaking to us through the scriptures. A point that needs to be uh, made here, I don't think it's in your notes, but we just need to recognize uh, when we're making this claim about inerrancy, 
formally, when we're saying that it's true, uh, we're making a claim, recognizing that inerrancy applies directly to the autographs, right? So we, we, we raised this notion last week. Uh, what are the autographs? These are the original texts, right? The, the, when God revealed himself and spoke through the prophets, through the apostles. When we're making this claim formally, we're saying that the Bible is inerrant. It is true uh, in the autographs. Recognizing, right, that we can't make this same claim of inerrancy for every single copy of the Bible that has ever been made, for every single translation that has ever been made, because we can come to some of those texts and some of those places and say, hey, this was not translated faithfully, or this is not faithful to the original. And so therefore, when we say make the claim of inerrancy, we are referring to the autographs, that God spoke clearly and truthfully uh, when the text of Scripture was, was given, uh, was, was written for us, so I'll just read a, read an explanation of that uh, from a from the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy. Uh, I would encourage you to read this on your own time. Uh, this was a statement made by evangelicals that came together in 1978, trying to articulate. Okay, we're saying that the Bible is inerrant; that it is true. What do we mean by that? That was a lot of words. Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy, and that was written in 1978. Uh, I put a, you can find the text of that on the Gospel Coalition's website. Just search it, and they have it there. So a faithful representation of what is inerrancy. It says inerrancy, so inspiration, so strictly speaking, applies only to the autographic text of Scripture. So again, strictly speaking, which in the providence of God, can be ascertained from available manuscripts with great accuracy. Copies and translations of Scripture are the Word of God to the extent that they faithfully represent the original. This is really helpful, right? Just recognizing that some translations are less faithful than others. And that's not attacking God's Word. That's saying, hey, we need to be faithful to God's Word as it was given in the original texts. So... Autographic texts, which can be ascertained from the available manuscripts. Any questions there? Oh, um, I'm not going to throw. I'm not going to throw any in that category. <laughs> okay, sure. Yeah, if it's a, if it's a. Occult translation, yeah, I would stay away from, right, yeah. Is that a thing? Okay, it's like, yeah, if that's that, yeah, I'd stay away from that one, for sure. better to say, hey, here's the top five. Top five, yeah, that's, that's a better way. Top five translations, I use the ESV. Part of that is because I think it's really helpful. Part of that's because that's what we preach from here, and that's not necessarily making a huge commitment claim. That's just we have to choose one, right? And that's what we preach and teach from most commonly here. I think the NASB is really helpful. Uh, I've used that in the past. Again, it's clunky, but I think it's good. Um, NIV obviously is very popular. Um, there's been multiple iterations of that. And you just recognize which one that you're using. Uh, that would be my top three. Okay, I won't do five. I'll do four. ESV, NASB, uh, I think are great. NIV and also the CSB. Um, that's kind of become the official Southern Baptist Bible, right? You know, uh, which I think is, is funny. Um, but so yeah, I'll recommend those to you and just because they're helpful. And I think most of you probably are already using one of those. But. Okay, well, there you go. Yeah, yeah. And the King James is great, right? It's just recognizing, can we understand the, the language that's within it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There you go. That's that's a way to put it. Okay. Uh, I do want to make one. It's going to take some time, but I think it's really really helpful. One kind of divergence here. When we're thinking about inerrancy, often when people make the claim, I believe that the Bible is inerrant. A phrase that you often hear attached to that is that I believe that the Bible is literally true. Anybody? Heard that or used that phrasing before? 
that I say, I believe, that, I believe that the Bible is true and inerrant, and therefore that I believe the Bible must be le- read literally. I believe the Bible is literally true. A distinction that I think can be helpful there that's been made by one guy, uh, his name's Kevin Van Hooser. He talks about this idea uh, and says we need to make a distinction between saying that the Bible is literally true in the sense of distinguishing between literalism, which would mean I'm, I have a commitment that I'm going to read every text of Scripture in the most literal sense possible. And so you read some of the prophetic passages or the apocalyptic passages and make, reading these things in the most literal, literal way possible. That's a literalistic approach to Scripture. And diverging that from what he would call reading the literal sense. So what do I mean by that? So reading the literal sense of the Scripture would say, whatever the author is doing, whatever the author is intending to communicate by the way in which he writes, the literary forms that he is employing, then that's how I'm going to approach the Bible, which I think is absolutely commendable. That is the way that we should approach the Scripture in the literal sense, in that whatever this author is communicating, that's what I'm going to affirm. Where literalism or a literalistic approach would say, regardless of the context, regardless of whatever literary forms are being employed, however I read it in the most rigid, strict sense, that's what it means. So that's a literalistic sense, which I think we would recognize pretty clearly is, uh, in some sense you could say, it does damage to the text itself. In that if we're running roughshod over what the authors themselves are trying to communicate, then we're not being faithful to the text, uh, even though we're seeking to be saying, I'm going to read it in a, in a literal sense. That has lots of implications, lots of things that come with it. Uh, But I think it's helpful for us to be, when we say that, I'm going to read the Bible literally. Are you meaning I'm going to read it as the Word of God? Then amen, please do that. If you're saying I'm going to read it literally, I would say, and you're meaning whatever this means on the surface, that's what it means. I would say let's read it according to the author's intention and according to the Holy Spirit's intention because that's what we have to do in all literature, right? And that's also how we have to read the Bible. An example, just to kind of make this more concrete, I'm not going to go very long, but just an example of this would be Mark chapter 4, verse 31. So this is where Jesus is preaching about the kingdom of God, and he's using parables. And he says, Mark 4, 31, uh, let me just read it for you. Mark 4, 31, Jesus says, Uh, or verse 30, and he said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which can then be sown on the ground, and is the smallest of all seeds on the earth. And yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants, and puts out large branches, and so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. Okay, some people will read that passage and say, Uh, Jesus is mistaken. The mustard seed is not the smallest seed in all of the earth. Therefore, Jesus' word, his words cannot be trusted. He has said something that is not literally true, and therefore we have to throw everything all out. Now, we laugh at that, but some ways in which some folks cast inerrancy, that sort of a claim would be a serious accusation. And so we have to ask, okay, that's the literalistic reading of what Jesus has said. He says that the, small, the, the mustard seed is the smallest of all the seeds on the earth. We have to ask, what was Jesus' intention in that claim? Was he making a botanical claim about the actual size of a mustard seed? Or was he making a claim in such a way that the people would understand in his audience and say, yes, the mustard seed is very, very small. And so, oft, and so also, the kingdom of God seems small and is unassuming and yet grows to, to be what it is, right? That's an example of this. How do we distinguish between a literalistic reading of the text and how do we, how do we in the opposite vein, say, no, what was the intention and what was the claim that is being made here? And we would not say that Jesus is making a physical claim about the actual side of this, size of this seed, 
but he's using it in a way that was understandable to the original readers in such a sense to make his true claim, which is about the kingdom of God. Does that make sense? Yes. Context is everything, right? Yeah. Were, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's just a distinction we have to make. And I, I think I included in your notes at the end recommended readings. Uh, there's a TGC article about, um, it's by Justin Taylor. It's like truth versus precision or something like that. I'd encourage you to reference that. Again, I'm not wholesale endorsing everything there, but helps to unpack that uh, a little bit more. I just want to say, too, that is something that I'm going to use as a critic. That's what they'll, they'll come at you with that. So check sure. out a few sentences as to what he just said. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. But to have a gentle answer showing that you, there's thought put into this. Yeah. And I do, there is an answer to it. Absolutely. Yeah. No, that's good. Yeah. Because I just know we've been, to, you know, un, in unsuspecting places, mm-hmm. all of a sudden someone will say that. Yeah. Sure. It's helpful to recognize what glasses we're wearing when we read the text because that is a very post enlightenment modernistic demand for precision in such a way that's just not it's not faithful nobody in the crowd saying hey hey jesus just wait a second hey you there are other seeds that are smaller than a mustard seed so you need to change your metaphor there that's not what they were doing they were recognizing the point that was being made okay just yeah yeah like so much of this if you think about students Mm. going to college you know yeah Yeah. And you hate, you know, I know it's a ton of students go off to the college and they hear somebody saying, hey, do you, do you think everything Jesus says is true? Well, it's not true. Yeah. And they just don't know what to do with yeah. it. You know, so mm-hmm. they just have this few really basic tools mm-hmm. to go along the way. Yeah. Of, Absolutely. You know, yeah. Because this is what's leveled. And there's multiple aspects of that. One, it's like so much modernistic post enlightenment. Is it C.S. Lewis, this phrase, he uses chronological snobbery? I think that's a C.S. Lewis term, which I think is so helpful. Which is to say, okay, we're going to level this. Do you think people over the last 2,000 years have just missed this and somehow Jesus made this ridiculous claim and we're just finally like, oh, okay, we've got to pitch it all out now. That's ridiculous. And also, too, also too though, to recognize there are some ways in which people talk about inerrancy, again, that this is a serious accusation against saying that inerrancy means I have to interpret every single word of Scripture literally in the sense that is not, just, is not recognizing the literary forms that are being used in the Scripture. And so that's, that's what we have to recognize there. I, do want to re- I just want to wrap up authority before we're done. So inerrancy, inspiration, all of this is under the characteristic of authority. What are the implications of biblical authority? And we say that the Bible is inspired, it's inerrant, it's infallible, it bears divine authority. What do, we, what do we have to work out from that? Well, we would say that the Bible is the final authority for the church. And final, and let's not get into that, final authority for the church. The belief in part demands belief in, In the whole. I don't love how that's worded, but essentially what it's communicating is that we don't get to come to the text of Scripture and say, "Uh, yeah, I like that, that's good, affirm that, that's inspired, and then come to something else that is less uh, tasteful to our modern sensibilities and say, ah, that clearly is not inspired, right? We can't, so let's just pitch that out. Um, 
I think last week's sermon is a good example uh, of that. So belief in part demands belief in the whole. And then lastly, to disobey or disbelieve the Bible is to disobey or disbelieve God. We have to always come back to that to recognize that what we're dealing with, we believe, is the Word of God written to us. And so if we disobey it, if we disbelieve it, that is a claim about who God is. That's a sense, that's a claim saying, God, I don't believe you're trustworthy. Uh, and also, and that extends to the realm of preaching and teaching to the extent that that preaching and teaching is faithful to the Word of God. Uh, when we disbelieve it, disobey it, also is a, is a claim about God himself and uh, disobeying him. To wrap that up, the Bible is authoritative for us, and we must always come back to the simple fact that we are blessed, that God has made it available to us, uh, that God has preserved it for us, and that we have such ready access to it in our current context and culture. Uh, because that's not the, that has not been the reality for so many Christians over the course of history and, and even today in parts around the world. Characteristics of the Bible. Uh, we got one of them. We got a couple more that we need to do. So we'll do that next week, I guess, and continue on. Any final questions from today? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, that's a good question. Where did I miss that? Read it to me one more time. What does it say? Uh, okay, uh, original. So just that's, again, that's that, uh, going back to the autographs point. And again, I don't really, I don't like how that's worded either. That's not to say... Not in the original writings, it affirms a lot of things contrary to fact. That's not what we're saying. Just recognizing that as a technical claim, when we say the Bible is inerrant, we are most chiefly referring to the original texts. And then all translations and copies since then, to the degree that they are faithful to the original, we affirm that they are inerrant, faithful to the word, true. Okay, thank you all so much. If you have any other questions, feel free to email me, and we'll uh, continue on next week. Thank you.